Welcome to Christ the Center, Doctrine for Life, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is episode number 219, and we are very delighted to be here today in studio. We have all the guests in studio, and we are going to be talking about something maybe unexpected. We're going to be speaking with some uh, lawyers and uh, going to be speaking about some recent uh, Supreme Court decisions that have a direct bearing upon uh, our daily lives as Christians and upon the relationship of the government uh, to the church, uh, particularly in the United States. Let me introduce to you today our panel. First, we have uh, James Sweet, who is counsel and director of special programs at Westminster Theological Seminary here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Welcome to the program, Jim. It's good to have you back. Thanks, Camden. Good to be here. Of course, Jim helped us out uh, tremendously in uh, allowing us uh, to become a 501c3 organization. He helped us with our filing and all of our information uh, so that we are official and on the books now as a nonprofit organization. So thanks again, Jim, for having us, and thanks for all your help with us and, and everything that you're doing here at Westminster Theological Seminary as well. I should mention that Jim is also former chairman uh, of Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath, a very well-known legal firm. We're also very pleased to welcome back to the program our guest, Dr. David Skeel, who is professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also the co-author of the blog, Less Than the Least, uh, and had a recent op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, welcome back, David. It's great to have you on again. Yeah, it's great to be back. David is uh, an elder, correct, at 10th am, Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, and uh, he's appeared on the program before discussing other related issues, and so we're delighted to have uh, qualified individuals here, legal <laughs> experts, but also a professor of law, uh, to discuss some things that are very important uh, for the life of the church. Um, but before we get started, I would like to mention, of course, in line with us being a 501c3 organization, that we are listener-supported, and we do rely on the generous support of all of our listeners and viewers to help us to continue to produce and distribute all of our programs free of charge. So if you're able to help, please visit us online at reformedforum.org slash donate, and you can uh, you can pledge your support today online. You can even send us a check or, a, or a, a cash or whatever you want to mail us would be fantastic, and the information for that is, is on the web as well well, our P.O. Box. I would do want to thank everybody for supporting what we do here uh, on Reform Forum and this program, Christ the Center. Well, gentlemen, I'm, I'm really am delighted to, to speak about this, and, and we sometimes hear about these um, decisions uh, that relate to religion and then the relationship of the church and state. We hear them on regular media, but we don't always hear them in application to uh, theology or more an application directly to the concerns of, of our audience and Reformed churches in particular. So we have here a recent decision, uh, a recent case, an appeal that went all the way up to the Supreme Court uh, dealing with the Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran Church and School in Redford, Michigan. And it relates to uh, an alleged violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. David, could you provide a little background for us and telling us what the issue was in this case and then why it's applicable uh, to, to Christians? Sure. The issue in the case involved a school teacher in this Lutheran school, which, uh, and the, the teacher had an illness, I think was it narcolepsy? It narcolepsy. Mm -hmm. She had narcolepsy and she had to take time off and eventually uh, reached an impasse with the school where the school uh, hesitated to bring her back on board. She threatened to sue and the school laid her off. And mm -hmm. so she argued that in laying her off, the school was violating the Americans with Disabilities Act. Mm -hmm. And the, the school responded by saying that there is effectively a religious exception mm. uh, to that. So in terms of its applicability, certainly applies potentially to any Christian school, any Christian ministry, and mm -hmm. I think we'll get into exactly what the, the contours of the decision mm -hmm. are. The, the decision ends up drawing a distinction between ministers and people who have ministerial functions, really um, core religious functions mm -hmm. on, the one, on the one hand, and on the other hand, folks who do not. Like accountants or IT people or something or like that. Or law professors. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, last I checked, UPenn is not a religious organization. No, it is not, uh, and has long prided itself on on that fact. Well, uh, yeah, a little more background. Um, 
<laughs> reading here are facts of the case, which was what was the name of that site? Oyez or Oye? How do you Oye. pronounce it? Yeah, Oye. Oye. Right, yeah. Um, reading from a, uh, a link there, I'll, I'll try to put a link to this in the show notes. Uh, this woman's name, Cheryl uh, Perrick, filed a lawsuit against the Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran Church and School in Redford, Michigan, for allegedly violating the Americans with Disabilities Act when they fired her after she became sick in 2004. After several months on disability, Perrick was diagnosed and treated for narcolepsy and was able to return to work without restrictions. But she said the school at that point urged her to resign, and when she refused, fired her. Of course, there's going to be a lot more detail to the, to the case yeah, than they, just that there. a couple of fairly important points there. Right, right. But the, the suggestion is, uh, obviously, the, the, the illusion here is that she was able to work, and they, they laid her off or they fired her for various reasons. So the main question in this uh in this case is does the ministerial exception, which prohibits most employment related lawsuits against religious organizations by employees who do perform religious functions, does that exception apply to a teacher at a religious elementary school who teaches the full secular curriculum, but also teaches daily religion classes is a commissioned minister and regularly leads students in prayer and worship. So we have some interesting dynamics going on uh, with this. Can you uh, just re- review a little bit of the appeal process and the, and the general practice of the Supreme Court in accepting an appeal of this nature? Where did this case start and how fast did it rise to the top and why did the Supreme Court eventually decide to accept the, the appeal? Some of those questions uh, I can only speculate. Mm. I think Jim can only speculate as well. But it starts out in a federal trial court, presumably mm-hmm. in Michigan. I don't remember mm-hmm. uh, exactly where the, the case began. Uh, it gets appealed to a federal appellate court, which mm-hmm. there would be the Sixth eight Circuit. Sixth Circuit. Sixth Circuit. Sixth Circuit. Uh, and then it gets appealed to the Supreme Court. The appeal from the trial level to the appellate court is available in any case. If if you have a federal trial court case mm-hmm. and you lose, you have a right to, to appeal, appeal to the right. appellate court. It's a basic legal right. It's yeah. a basic legal right. You do yeah. not have a right to have the Supreme Court hear your case. So the the discretion came in in the Supreme Court's decision to hear the case. And and your question, in a sense, is why did they take this why did case? They, yes. uh, I don't know for sure, but the Supreme Court had never explicitly recognized this ministerial exception that you've mm. been talking about. And this this is a very, very big issue. The mm-hmm. question of uh, the, the interaction between secular federal laws and religious institutions is hugely important. It's growing more important. Mm-hmm. So the, the fact that we had a, a really important issue and one on which the Supreme Court had not spoken authoritatively, it, it had not even said that there is a ministerial exception. So it was mm-hmm. possible the Supreme Court would, it, have, would have said doesn't exist. It doesn't or shouldn't exist, exist in any federal law uh, wow. applies to everybody, whether you're in a religious organization or not. So hmm. from that kind of a perspective, it was a hugely important case. So there's really no precedent before, which made it more interesting for the Supreme Court to... No, at- there, there were a number of lower court cases that had said there is a ministerial exception. So I see there were lots there was lots of precedent in the lower courts, the lo- okay. but there was not a Supreme Court precedent. And typically, the uh, Supreme Court will take cases when there's a uh, two circuits don't agree on an important point, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think in this case, as, as David said, I think all of the uh, circuit courts that had addressed the issue it come to the conclusion that there was, in fact, a ministerial exception. Let me add one, a couple of other things Yeah, here. please. She was commissioned or ordained or called, which is very important in mm-hmm. the decision, um, even though she was doing essentially the same thing a so-called lay teacher was doing, the fact that she was trained and commissioned and called mm-hmm. played a significant role in, the, in how the case spun out because the solicitor... Uh, representing the EEOC made the argument all along, well, we're not trying to tell the school and the church who their ministers are. We're just (laughs) trying to make sure that the anti-discrimination laws of the United States are applicable to everyone, whether or not they're a religious organization or not. So this notion that you're trying to choose our uh, ministers is simply uh, a red herring, Mm. according according to the government. There's a second issue that I thought 
was significant, and that was there was a tribunal available to her to uh, appeal her dismissal, and that would have been the Senate. A, chur- I think a church the, court? Church court, yeah. Yeah, Missouri Synod. Yeah, the right. Missouri yeah. Synod. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I, again, I'm not sure that that was called out as a significant issue, but uh, the Supreme Court clearly uh, had in the back of its mind, this woman had a remedy, another mm-hmm. remedy, which she chose not to avail herself of. Mm-hmm. Instead, what happens in these cases is you file an intent to sue with the EEOC, and the EEOC takes your case. This is basically EEOC in which she then um, appeared. She she intervened in this case, but it was basically a case brought by the EEOC. And that, that is? The Equal Employment Opportunity mm-hmm. Commission. Commission. So, mm-hmm. w- which she then uh, intervened in and, and I think carried the water on. And I think I think the ACLU carried the water on this too. Mm-hmm. And just from a Christian standpoint and, and something that I think is really encouraging, we've got a couple of really active and good uh, advocacy organizations out there. The Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, mm-hmm. for example, which was active in this case, and the Alliance Defense Fund both of which have taken it on themselves sort of to be the anti-ACLU, if you will, Mm -hmm. when when there's an issue of significant religious liberty out there. um, What what you will find is often the the school is overwhelmed because they've got a local lawyer, and the local lawyer is not sophisticated on these issues. Mm -hmm. Um, And so to, to protect the significant issue, you will get folks like the Beckett uh, Fund for Religious Liberty and the and, and the other one that I mentioned, the Alliance Defense Fund, intervening because this is what mm-hmm. they do, and they're very good at it. Mm-hmm. They're as good as the ACLU is on the other side, <laughs> which I think is important in balancing the tables on these very difficult yeah. cases because these are difficult cases. Oh, they, no doubt. They're very difficult. I mean, if you read the, the First Amendment, uh, uh, Congress will, shall make no law establishing religion or or, or, or the free, free um, what is it, the free exercise thereof, that's, that's a pretty thin network <laughs> to base a whole series of jurisprudence on. So these are very difficult cases. They are. I Absolutely. I should mention as well, uh, just to provide a Presbyterian context for these things, is a related issue. Often people can be called, ministers of the gospel can be called by their Presbyterian installed to things that are not necessarily, you know, a pastoral context in a church. Right. So many of the seminary professors, for instance, here, we're on the campus of Westminster Theological Seminary. Many, not all, but many of the professors are ordained ministers, are called by the Presbyterian installed to teach right. at the seminary and and um the same could be said of a christian school that some men uh ministers of the gospel would prefer to have that uh, accountability would also prefer to serve in the regional church so they go through the process and become ordained and then they are installed to their work um so that's really where some of the dynamics or the the intricacies of this case come in the fact that this woman uh was a, a minister a lutheran minister and uh was given to this work at a christian school but yet had this opportunity for the tribunal in, in the Missouri Synod and also was doing religious work at the same time of doing secular curriculum teaching. I, so. think, I think one of the real issues here is the entanglement uh, issue, and it came out in the cross-examination, if you will, or the, the questioning of the uh, solicitor who was representing the EEOC, and that is just a hypo. Mm-hmm. Well, do you take the position, for example, that uh, the Catholic Church now could be required to ordain women as priests? Mm-hmm. Well, no, we don't take that position. Well, well, why not? Well, why not? Where's the consistency? Well, because yeah. <laughs> that's that's a really important issue. Or, I mean, <laughs> I was not satisfied by the response, and frankly, there isn't a very yeah. principled response. I don't think, and that's I think that's where Alito and others came down and said, "Look, I, this is just we're going to get entangled in religion here if we start making these decisions." in applying anti-discrimination laws Mm. equally to a labor union or to a religious organization. Scalia said at one point to the Solicitor General, that is is extraordinary what you're arguing. He was stunned. Yeah, and this is a unanimous decision. It was 9 nothing in favor of the school. 9 nothing, and Elena Kagan actually Mm -hmm. may have been stronger than the Chief Justice was in some some respects. But in any event, it it was a 9 to nothing 
decision. Now, let me ask you, uh, as we as we continue our discussion here, can it be addressed whether this was a religious issue or not? Maybe I'm just thinking uh, from a layperson's perspective, an uh, untrained person. Could the court have asked whether this decision was religious related or not? Uh, because obviously the exception would apply to religious issues. We wouldn't want to say that the Catholic Church is required to ordain women because those are religious beliefs. Maybe they fired this woman because she uh, had a health issue that didn't interfere with any of her teaching capacities, but somehow they just wanted to get rid of her for other reasons. Maybe they didn't want to pay the insurance or something like that. Could it have been the the court's prerogative? Was it even possible to ask that question, or is that just not even an issue? I think that's the question. Oh, one of the key questions that's lurking underneath the analysis, mm-hmm. and that's what Jim was getting at, I mm-hmm. think, with his entanglement mm-hmm. um, point. And I, I think that question is still there. And okay. another way to ask the question would be, if you have a school like this in another case, and it's clearly pretextual mm-hmm. um, what they're doing, that, that, that it really has nothing to do with their synod, it has nothing to do with their religious beliefs, they just want to get rid of this teacher, mm-hmm. uh, would, uh, would the Supreme Court say the same thing? Or, for instance, if a school were to fire someone on what looked to be racial grounds, mm-hmm. um, but said, uh, really, there were religious reasons for doing what we do, would the, would the, would the court ever second guess what a, uh, a school or a church is doing? I think the answer is yes, that mm-hmm. there, there could be a case where they would second guess what the school or church is doing. Mm -hmm. But I think they're making really clear they don't want to go down that road. And Mm -hmm. so if there's a plausible religious explanation, and it involves a minister, the fact that it involves a minister is crucially important. And the question of just who is a minister is going to be crucially important. Mm -hmm. But if it is a minister, I think the court is going to try not to go there. Mm -hmm. I agree. In the pretextual issue came up several times uh, in, the, in, in the oral argument. Um, but I, and I think that's a sort of an issue for another day because you get sham ordinations all the time. Uh, it's a, it's a, <laughs> you it's could a get candidate. ordained online. You could just fill out a, from the, yeah, the Universal Life Church. Universal Life Church, <laughs> Church Bedside Baptist or something like that. You know, you, <laughs> so I think those are issues that are the, the government may come back on someday. Well, this is clearly pretextual. It's, it's prima facie pretextual. But that was not, that was not, didn't carry the day here. No, sure. and they made very clear, I think, they, they don't want to be looking at those kinds of right. issues, that it would have to be outrageously pretextual, I think, before the, the court's going to dive in. And that's not really something that the Supreme Court is interested in or concerned with getting into, are they? Not if they no. can help it. And, and that is <laughs> I mean, like, the one consistent theme in these cases going back a century yeah. is... If it looks like the court is going to be addressing court uh, church dogma, dogma <laughs> as they often refer to it, um, they went out. Uh, they 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 don't want to go down that yeah, road. That makes sense. Um, and a fascinating discussion here. Let's come back to the uh, the issue of the church court and the appeal process. What if a church, for religious reasons, let's say they're a highly uh, hierarchical or Episcopalian type model? which the, the Catholic Church is Episcopalian-type model in terms of a bishop being in charge. What if, for religious reasons, there is no appeal process? Yeah. The Pope or the head bishop yeah. says that's the that's the case. It's an infallible declaration or whatever. No appeal process. Yeah. That's it. That's a religious belief. Well, uh, as I said, that issue was lurking back there. Mm-hmm. It was, the Supreme Court clearly had in its mind that this woman did not, as we say in the trade, exhaust her remedies. But I don't think I'm not sure it was a key point in coming to the decision. In other words, if there hadn't been an opportunity mm-hmm. to exhaust her remedies, I don't know that the court would have uh, decided the case any differently because as a matter as a matter of principle, they found she was a minister and they found that there is a ministerial exception. So, David, I don't know if you agree with that, but I don't know what they would have done, frankly, if there had been no higher court, if you will, the synod in this case. Do you have a different opinion? I I don't have a strong opinion one way or another. I didn't get the sense that that was driving them I that know. much. I may have been mistaken, but I, I I guess I would read the opinion as saying even if she does not have a higher 
internal court uh, church court to go to, she uh, she still loses that she is a minister. She subjected herself um, by taking this job to the the rules and the oversight of the school, and because she is performing ministerial religious functions, she's subject to them. So I I'm, I agree. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I just my only point of it was lurking back there because I mentioned it sometime, and I think it gave him a little internal comfort. Is all I'm <laughs> I, saying. And sometimes you never know why judges decide things the way they do. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I. I tried cases for years, and I never knew why I won or lost, frankly. So. <laughs> Is that what you told your clients? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, I don't know if we're going to lose or win. But, uh, <laughs> you never, sometimes you just don't know. Yeah. You just, you just don't know why, what what appeals, what arguments appeal to a, a court and what don't. But I, I think in this case, it's clearly the the uh, the issues that David outlined that caused it. And this was, mm-hmm. this was a clearly a subordinate matter that, uh, that didn't mm-hmm. affect the decision. Now we've brought up the point about the Solicitor General. What what is the White House's involvement here, and how did things go about this? And how much does the executive branch have to do with uh, maybe trying to set the stage for for some of these arguments? Well, other than other than <laughs> I, I'm going to defer. <laughs> we, we other than have thoughts on this, I'm sure I, I, we probably do. I mean, the the Solicitor General is often referred to as the president's lawyer, mm-hmm. and so. The president has a great deal of control. In fact, I believe the the president can instruct the solicitor general which position to take on an issue. And from time to time, the the president will overrule what the solicitor general was planning to do. So the the solicitor general is is really the executive branch. It's really representing the the views of the administration. Right. Uh, Appointed by the administration and serves at the administration's pleasure and articulates, I believe, the positions of the administration, Not maybe not just the president, but broadly the administration. Yeah. So I think you can say that the fact that the solicitor, uh, assistant solicitor in this case, who I thought made an excellent argument, was clearly very good, was not mistakenly mm-hmm. saying things, the fact that she articulated a position that um, essentially for purposes of the anti-discrimination laws, such as came into play here, labor unions, uh, uh, organizations, and religious organizations are treated the same. That's a position that's pretty aggressive. Right. Pretty aggressive. Uh, That's not pretty aggressive. That's very aggressive. And it it was so aggressive that, as I said, the uh, Justice Scalia, you have to hear it, but he essentially said, that is extraordinary. Yeah, the audio is available online. I'll put a link to that as well, and you can actually go listen to uh, the stunned. audio. It's fascinating. Or at least he yeah. acted yeah. like he was stunned. And it, so the fact that this was at a very aggressive position being asserted by the um, by the Solicitor General, I don't think it was an accident. I think it reflects generally the view of the administration on these issues. And I think as you look at some of these other data points that, Hopefully, we'll get into now or later. Um, mm-hmm. You'll see that uh, that that there is a an increasing how how would we say it, David? An increasing interest by government regulators in in to to breach this religious barrier that the First Amendment, this free exercise clause that the First Amendment is is. Um, yeah, that, now that, that's my view. I I mean that's that's opinion. That's maybe not what a law professor would say. But, but. <laughs> so you're suggesting law professors don't simply give opinions? No. Uh, I, law professors are much more mm, by the book. I'm flattered that you would think so, but I, <laughs> let me give my opinion, uh, right. which is I do think that's a lot of what was, was driving, at least the way the case was written, what the Supreme Court wrote the opinion. Chief Justice Roberts, who wrote the opinion, went out of his way to reject the argument, the government's argument, that uh, any protection churches have is the same protection as any other uh, association, Mm -hmm. any other group. And and the Supreme Court firmly um, and pretty aggressively said that simply is not true. There's no basis for that in the Constitution. There's no basis mm-hmm. for that in, in our cases. So that was one of the big takeaways of the decision is religion is special under our Constitution. And the fascinating thing is that Elena Kagan was the solicitor earlier in the administration, <laughs> and they totally, apparently, totally misread this, I guess. Yeah. How would you explain that? 
How, how could you misread it so badly that even the former solicitor, who presumably shared the views of the administration, came down as strongly as she did yeah, against if she was appointed by the administration. Yeah, the only thing I can think <laughs> of is there is a, there's a case from about 20 years ago. Yeah. I think it's a 1989 case called mm-hmm. Smith, which had held – it was a case that involved pay, um, peyote, the, um, oh. the drug that Native some Native American, Native American yeah. religions use. And the Supreme Court said in an opinion by Justice Scalia, Scalia – oh that uh, that religions are subject to the same laws everybody else is subject to, so that these uh, Native Americans could be prosecuted for smoking Con- Controlled K-O-T. substances. Even it's part of their religious Right. And so I, I think what the Solicitor General was probably thinking is this is simply an extension of the Smith case, uh, oh. suggesting that there's nothing special about religions, at least if if we're talking about a law that's not singling the religion out, that applies to everybody. And so another important takeaway from this opinion, I think, is that it really raises questions about that earlier decision. It does suggest Mm -hmm. that religion is special, and it does suggest that at least in the Supreme Court, there is an interest in carving out a space so that religion, religion and religious organizations can operate without interference from um, from secular law or from the government. Wow, that's <laughs> that's fascinating. You know, we can talk about the significance of uh, Hosanna Tabor for a long time. Yeah, a lot has been written about it, but um, there's 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 a couple of broader data points out there too. Yeah, that came out at the same time. Let me just touch on them. If Please you, go ahead. And then uh, it maybe at a later date or whatever we can talk about it. But about the same time, there was a Sixth Circuit case called uh, Julia Moore versus Eastern Michigan University, which mm. I think is a significant case too. It, it involved a woman named Julia Moore who was in a, a, po, uh, uh, in a beyond bachelor. I guess she was getting her master's in counseling uh-huh. at Eastern Michigan. And as part of her practicum, she was uh, under the care of her, her mentors doing counseling work. And she learned in advance that somebody that had been assigned to her was homosexual. And, and she read from this that... Uh, she would be looked to affirm that lifestyle. Mm. She's, and so she asked for a referral of this person away because while she said she would be happy to counsel a homosexual, she could not affirm the lifestyle because mm-hmm. of her Christian position. Well, what happened was they, they essentially said, if you can't do that because the American Counseling Association, the organizing body here requires, has a no referral policy apparently, or so they said. So they... They they uh they took her out of the program. They yeah. took her out of the program. She sued, and back to this federal court um, uh, issue, the Eastern Michigan University was awarded what we call summary judgment, essentially on the law. There was no facts at issue, and the and the court found that Eastern Michigan was yeah. allowed to do this as a matter of law. And this gets into another real tough issue of pedagogy in the in the academy that I don't think we need to go to. But essentially the Sixth Circuit reversed and and found that a jury could find her take, being taken out of the program entirely pretextual because one, they there was no ban uh, by the ACA on uh, referrals and Eastern Michigan had allowed referrals before, <laughs> so uh, so it was it, it went back for a jury. It's going to go back for a for a trial so that she can show that. Uh, her religious this is a religious liberty clause mm-hmm. um anyway dave i don't know if you read that case too but it was interesting that it came down a second religious liberty case came down at about the same time they're different cases mm-hmm. but again uh it is a religious liberty clause yeah. but just just to throw things open when we uh when we need to be finishing i know um there's another finished. set of issues that's come out at the same time as well which is uh which is a little bit different but related and that is uh shortly after the hosanna tabor decision came down the obama administration uh issued a ruling that said under the the health care law yeah. uh, that was passed a couple of years ago there is an exception for um, for 
churches <clears throat> with respect to um, the health care laws requirement that they provide contraception mm -hmm. and abortion pills and things like that. But it is a very limited exception and that the uh, the exception would only apply to really to churches and pervasively religious organizations. It would not apply to things like many Catholic schools uh, or it would apply, apply to I guess it would apply to most Catholic schools. It would it, it might. Yeah. But not charities and hospitals. Right. Not charities and not hospitals which seemed to be a ruling from within the administration that was at odds, at least with the spirit of Hosanna Tabor. It's oh, yeah. The, the ruling seemed to suggest that any religious carve-out was going to be as, as limited as possible, and in the weeks since then, the issue has really blown up. Now, what happened with uh, President Obama after he went back to try to formulate some sort of compromise? What was the uh, the outcome of that? So the compromise revisit? was uh, that uh, many people put compromise in quotes, yeah. was that insurance companies would be required to provide contraception and, and abortion pills and things like that. The churches and schools would not themselves be required to, to provide this coverage. It's still accessible to their employees if their employees it want it. It would be accessible to their employees, and it created a, a big problem, has created a big problem with a number of, of organizations, particularly those that self-insure. So that yeah. if, if the uh, Catholic charity, instead of having an insurance company provide its health insurance, mm -hmm provides, uh, bears the costs of the health insurance itself, this ruling is essentially saying that the charity has to provide contraception uh, coverage for its employees. And even those that aren't self-insured, they're still paying the premium. So yeah, it's, you're it's still really, paying for it. It's, it's, right. it's, a, it's a bit of a sham. And the interesting thing, again, for another day, David, that I see in all of this is the language of accommodation. We're accommodating the church. I find that to be kind of offensive language. And the reason I find it to be offensive is it's in the Constitution. You have, <laughs> you have free exercise rights, so the government yeah. shouldn't be accommodating anything. They, I, I just find the term right. accommodate, well, well, we're going to accommodate these people. Well, no, this is a matter of extraordinary personal conscience with the Catholic Church. And, I mean, initially they were going to give them a year to uh, a, a year to get get used to it and, and I think Tim, <laughs> I think timothy dolan had the classic line he said well they're giving us a year to figure out a way to uh violate our consciences and i <laughs> yeah. thought that was a great line i thought you know come you know, up with a way this has been our position forever we're not going to change our position in a year oh yeah and the yeah. other classic line was somebody said you know yeah even even jesus christ would have had to uh, could, couldn't have met the standards here so yeah so anyway this whole this whole issue of uh, the regulations um, is going to play out, I think. Mm -hmm. in the in the issue that I mentioned before that um, the government is has taken the position, for example, that historically to pay you could get a reduction of your student loan down to zero. Yeah. Ultimately, if you can you get the mic a, closer to? You? I'm if sorry. You, if you work for a five hundred one c three. Yeah. <laughs> just in February. I mean, it's it's striking. Let me let me just read you how the how how this changed because I think this is again. I'm finding myself being a conspiracy theorist here. It's it's kind of oh, kinda I'm a, I'm more and more each day becoming it's, suspicious. It's, the it's, thing that frightens me so much too is the uh, the growing power of the executive branch. Yeah. It's getting out of control. Here's the old rule. Qualifying employment is any employment with a federal, state, or local government agency or organization or a nonprofit organization that has been designated tax exempt under 501c3. That's historical rule. Mm -hmm. Effective February 1st. The new last sentence reads as follows, or the last two sentences. Generally, generally, the type or nature of employment with the organization does not matter. <laughs> However, if you work for a nonprofit organization, your employment will not qualify for this loan reduction if your job duties are related to oh. religious instruction, oh. worship services, or any form of pro oh. proselytizing. That's dramatic. It is dramatic. That's, and that, to me, is the same issue Dave was mentioning before uh, and touched on. This is the administration's lawyer. These are the administration's mm -hmm. people. 
and you're seeing a, an encroaching mm -hmm. view by the government mm -hmm. into religion, and it's going to—it's incremental, mm -hmm. but it's—it's—it's uh, it's constant. Mm -hmm. Push here, get rejected. And Hosanna Tabor. Push here. Mm, the Catholics aren't happy, but maybe it's going to work. Push here. Maybe nobody notices this new. Thing. Exactly. Push, push, push. And it's going to continue to be a push. It's going to continue. It is. It's frightening. Uh, before we started the recording, I mentioned uh, this is the private sector. This is this is business donations, so it's not a constitutional issue. I, I guess we could maybe bring up the issue of discrimination, but uh, but um, once we became a 501c3 organization, Reform Forum, that is, um, you know, I was looking for various software discounts, uh, which are readily available to charities. Sure. Um, and many companies like Adobe, I was looking for some discounts on some of their audio and video editing suites. Um, Microsoft and others uh, have Google have don donation programs for various products and services, and they're ex accessible to all 501c3s now except religious organizations. Some, If your organization is, is devoted to uh, teaching one particular view, uh, or if it's a proselytizing, or some, certain, certainly things that Reform Forum does, yeah. uh, you know, they, uh, we don't qualify. Now it's a pri they're private. They don't have to donate to everybody. No, I'm not suggesting that at all. But I'm saying it's yet another uh, picture of what's going on in our society and our culture in terms of the views of religion. They wanna they wanna just m flatten it. The executive branch wants to flatten it and make laws apply to everybody, regardless, even if it infringes upon their religious liberties. And then businesses are basically not wanting to even touch a religion uh, or a religious organization because it might cause some kickback think of the uh susan g coleman yeah. foundation and and uh and planned parenthood which neither of those are religious organizations but yet the just the demonstration of what can happen if you touch on a nerve the kickback the yeah. blowback is just outrageous uh, yeah and this the administration certainly influences oh yeah these things but my my belief is that no matter what the administration is uh the the progression of the regulatory state is going to continue unabated. I mean, there hasn't been a president ever that's made government smaller. The what Reagan, It's a lot of nominees that talk about well, it. Well, yeah, and, and <laughs> but it Reagan never got happens. credit for it, but basically he slowed the growth. Yeah. And that's all you can do. And the regulators have, have I'm starting to stop. My kids, if they ever see this, they're going to think I'm a whack job. <laughs> but I don't think I'm crazy in this. The, the regulators have essentially, in many places taken the role of a lazy Congress. For example, in Obamacare, the secretary shall, the secretary shall promulgate, the secretary shall do this, the secretary shall do that. Well, I mean, this is, these are laws that affect all of us, mm -hmm. that the secretary and her regulators are now doing. Mm -hmm. This should never have come to this, that, um, that the secretary can decide who's religious and who yeah. isn't religious. That it's, shouldn't be the, the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Should no. not be making that decision. No, and we get these czars now in government. We have executive orders that, that yeah. many of them slip by. And it's a frustrating thing. It's something to think about this election year when we think about just basic philosophy of government. So, uh, my, so my point is, I think this government, has the gover this particular administration has accelerated the process, but I don't think that they are the only ones. Sure. Think whether... Whether uh, uh, if uh, McCain had been uh, elected president, whether the solicitor would have taken this position on the yeah. uh, Hosanna Tabor case, I doubt it. I'm yeah. confident wouldn't have, and Obamacare wouldn't have been passed. Uh, but but certainly the secular state through the regulators have been and will continue to be encroaching upon religious yeah. liberty, and I think that's a very important subject for all Christians to think about going forward. Now, specifically speaking, just as we wrap up this Hosanna Tabor case, we've we've also uh, probably in, in a future discussion need to talk about the, the religious symbols and, and imagery in public square, in the public square, the Ten Commandments, that sort of thing. We could even talk about prayer in school, that's that sort of thing down the road. But Hosanna Tabor specifically, and this nine zero unanimous decision. What does this mean for the future of these types of cases? If we're going to be seeing more of them, or if it's going to be an increased issue, what does this particular judgment mean for the future well, I think prospects? David, David said it well in uh, in the uh, 
opening paragraph or so of his Wall Street Journal argument, the, the paradox of the government essentially being uh, slugged back, if you will, on the Hosanna Tabor case, nine to nothing, mm -hmm. including the Solicitor General sitting uh, on the Supreme Court, the former Solicitor the former. General, mm -hmm. um, every, in my view, totally misreading the court on that issue. And yet, very shortly later, coming out with uh, these HHS, reg HHS regs, I mean, they almost happened at the same time. One would think that the government would have said, hmm, maybe we ought to back off a little on that one. <laughs> Apparently not. Well, and the Supreme reason, Court sent a message. Yeah, the, the Supreme Court <laughs> sent a message, and everybody's reading it as a message. It's not like, yeah. this is a big case. It's a huge case. It's probably the most important case in religious liberty in 30 years, maybe mm. 40 years. So it's a big case. It didn't go under the radar, but notwithstanding that, the, gov the government or the administration still said, no, nah, we think it's okay to uh, ask Catholics to do this mm -hmm. or to tell Catholics they have to do this mm -hmm. or suffer the penalty. You know, it's Catholics could, of course, decide not to provide health care. Mm -hmm. But the penalty is, is $2,000 per employee per year. Mm -hmm. So, for example, at Notre Dame, which is not, you know, always in sync with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops in all points. Mm -hmm. They invited Obama to speak, and you know this is this is a pretty relaxed place in in, in some ways. Five thousand employees, two thousand if they decide not to yeah. do two thousand for it. That's ten million bucks a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for your for your for your religious liberty. For your religious liberty. <laughs> that's pretty dramatic. Yeah, that's pretty wild. So these are issues. That's that, a football coach. Yeah, no, no, football coach. <laughs> you just don't uh, don't play football, for you. but um, I I agree this is an important um, election coming up. My point was though that even though maybe some of the more aggressive on, uh, inroads will not be tried, like perhaps the argument in Hosanna Tabor, um, that doesn't mean that the that the state just in its own sheer force of regulation isn't mm -hmm. going to continue to make inroads because it is. Yeah. In, in a variety of ways, not just judicial, but because yeah. of the, because the secular state's interest mm -hmm. is to advance itself. <laughs> and there, there are very few religious ro roadblocks in the way the Catholic church, God bless them. I mean, wh where are we in all of this? Like it's the Catholics that are out there in front of this issue. I, I love the fact that the Catholics are. Mm. Out there. Well, there, are, yeah, definitely political reasons and uh, organizational yeah. opportunities that they have afforded to them. That uh, the OPC, for instance, yeah. <laughs> have a lot of resources. Yeah, we don't have law schools. Yeah, either. and 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 a lot of the chatter you hear out there is, well, look, they put up with they put up with homosexual priests and they they climbed you know pedophile priests and they overlooked all of this. It can't be that important to them. Well, I mean that's. That's really not a, a defense for a matter of conscience like like this. This is really a matter of conscience to them. And I'd, I'd, I'd add here in, in closing that they call this contraception, but there's abortifacients and sterilization yeah. come under the rubric and the secretary's rubric of mm. contraception. And yeah. the morning after pill, as I understand it, I'm certainly no expert, is after contraception has yeah. taken place yeah. and it's abortifacient. Yeah. To allow it not to implant in the uterine wall. Or yeah. I, I believe that's it. So it's not really contraception. Right. It's beyond contraception. Yeah. But regardless, uh, the main issues here are definitely about uh, religious liberty, whether we're speaking of Catholic liberty or Mormon liberty or uh, Reformed Christian liberty, what, whatever. We need to uh, protect that uh, and understand, I think, at root, I think what we can find in Genesis 4, I follow Klein on this point, that the government, the state is established to uh, promote justice and to restrain evil. And, uh, you know, basically those are the two main things it needs to do. And um, and it, it doesn't want to do that because it wants to continue to grow and have power and influence. And if religion is untouchable, then that's... Uh, limiting the power that the government can have in some way. Well, Jim, it's been fantastic to have you. I do want to remind people uh, of our previous discussion uh, with, with Jim and David uh, on, uh, on uh, several issues. You can find that in the show notes. Uh, 
David, uh, professor of law at University of Penn, of course, he had to hard out, so uh, we aren't able to close with him, but we'll definitely invite him back, and you as well, and we'll, we can discuss these issues further and any new issues that come up, because they're going to be more. My guess is that we'll see some new issues in the next couple of months. Yeah. Well, we'll certainly uh, address that. And, of course, I'll put links in, in the show notes to uh, to this information, the David's um, uh, op-ed at the Wall Street Journal, as well as the uh, information at OEA, which has um, the audio file for the for the for the Supreme Court's uh, decision uh, and a really fantastic transcript. So you, you even get to know who's talking at what time. It's it's a really fantastic setup. Uh, so that'll all be available uh, online. Uh, visit us online there at reformedforum.org and there you'll find information about all of our programs, not just Christ the Center, but everything that we're doing, as well as uh, calendars and uh, updates about uh, news and events coming up in the Reformed world. Uh, if you'd like to get a hold of us, please email us at mail at reformedforum.org or Twitter. You can tweet us at Reformed Forum. I want to thank everybody for listening and hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center. <laughs>